If you say, I, I don't have enough money to manage, you do. Otherwise, you wouldn't be listening to this. You Somehow you've got a device <laughs> to be able to listen to this. So you do have money to manage. And <clears throat> lots of people tell me, yeah, I will uh, start when I have more money, right? That's like saying, I will go to the gym once I've lost weight. Welcome to the Business Ownership Podcast, brought to you by Awareness Strategies, helping you navigate the waters between entrepreneurship and ownership. Hey there, peeps. This is Michelle Nidalek, and I am super glad that you're here with us today because I'm here with my most amazing guest, Florian. Florian, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much for inviting me, Michelle. It's great to be here. <laughs> awesome. So give us a quick highlight. Who are you and a quick introduction to your business? What do you do? Uh, my name is Florian, Florian Fritz. I'm a money teacher from Vienna, Austria, uh, where I founded the Money Hero Academy. And that's where I help people to improve their financial situation, to go from financial worries and stress around money to becoming money heroes who can create wealth and financial freedom. And I do that by working with them on the three pillars of financial success, money mindset, money management, and money making. Oh, love that. We will get into that in a little bit, but let's back up the bus a little bit. And how did you get into all of that? Well, I started as a financial advisor like 19 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, which was fun. Um, we had a good team and I made a lot of money and I learned a lot there. Um, but yeah, for, for a few years until the last uh, great crisis in 2008. And I already between that, I had some doubts about some pro uh, products that we were selling but that's when I really saw, okay, I don't like how the financial industry is treating their clients, meaning the client is taking all the risk and paying all the fees and the banks and investment companies, they take all the profits and make all the money. So, <laughs> Yay, somebody who agrees with me. Yay. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't really like that concept and wanted to learn how to do it better, right? So I found that I actually what I, the lot that I had learned was how to sell financial products. I was really good at that. Mm -hmm. But real financial uh, strategies, how do you build wealth when whatever the market's doing, right? It can go up, down, sideways, crazy, whatever it's doing, there's always people who make money from it. Nice. Yes, there is. And I wanted to learn how to do that. So I started, well, first of all, I had to make money again because I did, made one big uh, mistake that I teach my clients not to do, which was spending all the money I made as a financial advisor. So first I had to start making money again, which I did by joining a real estate company, finding investors for them. They had a pretty fair offer. So I was happy with that. And now I did spend the money again, but now I spend it on education. I traveled around the world to learn from some of the greatest trainers, people like Robert Kiyosaki and T. Herf Ecker and a couple of ex-fund managers. So I learned a lot on how real wealth building strategies work. And I tested that in that real estate company. Mm -hmm. uh, that worked pretty well. We, we grew their sales by 86% on average for, for eight years. Nice. And yeah, when things go well, some people tend to sabotage themselves. Uh, I'm, I seem to be one of them. So oh. I, started, I started a second company with a, with a partner in solar energy. And then I didn't take care of that enough because it was actually his idea and um, whatever. Yeah, he bankrupted the company and suddenly I was half a million dollar in debt. Oh, that had to hurt. And more or less at the same time, the real estate company said, actually, uh, we don't want that many new clients and in investors anymore. And we don't want to pay your high commissions anymore. Uh, we don't want that the person that spends least time in the office makes most money. <laughs> So easy income gone, lots of debt. And that's the, f the funny idea I had then that now I know what works. I've made help those people make millions. I know what doesn't work. I went bankrupt myself. Um, I know how to manage money if you don't have any. <laughs> and I learned a lot from all these great trainers. I find that money is really easy to manage when you don't have any. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah you could, it's not really the problem I want to solve. <laughs> That way, no. And I knew all the mistakes that my clients as a financial advisor uh, did. So I thought if I take all that together, then I can actually help people pretty well avoid those mistakes, make the things that do work and get them better with their money. So 
Uh, actually, it was a strange point in time to start teaching money. Uh, but still, that's what I did. <laughs> that's awesome. So let's delve into kind of what the what the rules of the game are. Because I think right now, more than ever, people are super concerned about kind of what's coming up. There's a little intrepidation. By the time they listen to this, that, uh, you know, the, the financial world may have changed a little bit. I'm thinking that economics is kind of entertaining subject right now. So I'm delving into it immensely. <laughs> so yes, you have my ear. <laughs> so let's talk about your, your principles and what do people do? Uh, the principles, well, I do have uh, the Money Hero Dream Roadmap, nice. which is 12 steps to create your financial freedom. And it starts with, obviously, with step number one. It's a good place to start. <laughs> good place to start, yeah. And if you think about uh, things, uh, if you want to lose weight, what's the first thing you should do? The first step is... Stop eating all the crap Stop in, eating. in yeah, my before, before, before that. that. Wanna, oh, mine's out. Yeah. You gotta wrap your head around, make a commitment. That this is what you're gonna do. All these things, but the first step is step on the scales and see where you're starting from. Yeah. Before you do all that Point. mindset and eat less and move more, yeah. Because uh, <laughs> it all makes sense, but it all makes sense. But you want to know where you're starting from. So next of week course. you can check: Did I improve or not? Good. Did it work or not? Whatever I'm doing. So the same thing is is for money. You want to know where you're starting from. So just make your financial statement. What's my income? What's my expenses? There's been a um, research, um, more or less recently, 67% uh, of people don't know how much they spent last month. And the same wow. sample, 50% said money is their biggest issue. I think there might be a connection between those two. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. So let's start with where they're at. So for most people, I'm sure it's almost as easy as just opening up a bank statement. And then for the entrepreneurs, it's, you know, pulling all the, <laughs> all the bank statements, all yeah, the S&Ps. Look, all the... Income, okay. How much was my income? That's easy for most people, for entrepreneurs, a bit more work, <laughs> but know how much you're making, know how much you're spending, and then know your assets and liabilities. How do, how much do I have and how much do I owe? And then don't confuse those two. That's something that uh, many people do. Uh, confusing assets and liabilities because that's how we learn it, right? Your house is your biggest asset. Well, to make it Absolutely simple, your biggest and, liability. <laughs> it's your biggest liability, exactly. If you take a simple definition by by Kiyosaki, uh, an asset is something that puts money into your pocket, and the liability is something that takes money out of your pocket. I know uh, accountants don't see it exactly that way, but for building wealth, that's that's how it helps. And your house costs money; it doesn't give you money as long as you live in there. Mm -hmm. So people confuse those two um, because the bank says it is an asset. And of course it is an asset for the bank. <laughs> Which was always really confusing to me in accounting. I was wrapping my, I, my head around the idea that all of my assets were liabilities to the bank and all of my liabilities were assets to the bank. Absolutely. And they being able to realize that all of my financial statements were from their perspective, not mine. Yeah. So they absolutely do love you to pay mortgage. So that's why they want you to buy a bigger house. Right. Now, so people confuse those two. But yeah, start building your, for creating your financial statement, know your numbers, and then you can start improving. Then we do mindset. Yeah, how do you think about money? Um, because if you think you have to work hard for money, what are you probably going to do? Work, work harder. Hard, right? yeah. Work harder and harder and harder. Now, how many of those hardworking people are actually rich? Not a lot. Yeah, most of them are not, right? So you working hard is good, yeah, but you also have to work smart. Yeah. Make a plan. Like uh, Rockefeller said, it's better to take one day a month to think about your money than to work the whole month for it. Love it. And he also said, if you're working all day, you have no time to make money. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, the ironies keep kicking in, yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, think about your money, make a plan. Um, what do I want it for? What do I actually want money for? I don't want money to just have it. Mm -hmm. Right. Just having a million in my bank account doesn't make me any happier. But all the stuff I could be doing with it might. <laughs> so what do I want money for? When do I want it? How how does my dream life look like that? Like, yeah, just make a plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, make have lots of goals. Um, 
I usually tell people to write uh, the bucket list of 101 things. Mm -hmm. um, but if you write more than that, it's better. The more you have, the better. <laughs> so know what you actually want it for, for. And yeah, now you know where you are, you know what you want. Now it's already a lot easier <laughs> to actually start working on it, right? Then you think about, okay, um, how could I make more money, mm -hmm. right? Want to increase your income. How could I make more? Um, if I'm employed, can I start a side hustle? Can I, if I'm, if I have my own business, okay, how can I increase the income? What what else can I do? And how can I make that money work for me? Right. Manage the money so I keep more of it. That's another problem people have. Right. There's so much month left at the end of the money. Yes. Um, and there's actually a law that that describes that's Parkinson's law. Parkinson's law tells you that uh, the demand for something will always match its supply. You, you know that from time, right? If you take uh, two weeks to, to clean your house, it's going to take two weeks. <laughs> exactly. Give yourself two days, it's going to take two, two days. days. And if your parents call and say, we'll be there in two hours, it takes two hours. Right? <laughs> exactly. And the same is true for money. You look at your bank account, you see money, you spend it. So you have to do differently. You have to take something away uh, in the beginning. So it's not going to, you don't see it anymore and you don't spend it. And then you start keeping money and then you want to make that money work for you. You start to learn, learn about investing and invest. That, that was one of the biggest things I think I learned from Harv was, Harv Ecker was the concept of separating accounts. And he did it in a in a personal sense, but we started doing it in our um, business accounts so that we were separating kind of this hasn't been fulfilled yet you know we'll hold off uh, it has its own account in case there's chargebacks and then that money goes gets put into operations operations has so much money to be able to run off of it the taxes have its hot spot the um, employee benefits has its hot spot because being able to separate those things out visually it really did make a difference to thinking that you have this money and then realize, <laughs> it's like, no, actually, we don't have that much money. And, and you operate from a completely different mindset when you're kind of it's still in, you're realizing that you're still in the bootstrapping <laughs> kind of phase, as opposed to the lap of luxury phase that you might, you know, naively think that you're in until you realize, hey, this, this is all accounted for already. So, uh, like, don't be thinking that that's part of the game. And it just, for me, it allowed me to not stress out about the bills, but just to know, okay, this is this is what's coming in. This is what's got to happen. And understanding operations just a little bit better because of it. Yeah. So for personal, as you said, mentioned, uh, Harf's uh, jar system is, is great. Uh, you can read that in The Secrets of the Millionaire Mind in his book. And for, for business, I also have a book that has a very good system. And I think the combination is very powerful. Uh, which is Profit First by Mike Michalowicz. Mm -hmm. uh, for, Talk to me about that. For for business. That's actually, you know, the the old system uh, to calculate profit is income minus expenses equals profit. Mm -hmm. Now, since we've already talked about Parkinson's law, if you do it that way, how much profit is going to be there? <laughs> Probably zero, right? Yep. <laughs> so we turn it around because... If you want to make, build wealth, you got to pay yourself first. Mm -hmm. So the new uh, way of calculating profit is income minus profit equals expenses. So what you do, you open an extra account, and every time your money comes in, you take five percent of it, depending on your size. If the business uh, business goes bigger, you take a bit more. Uh, five percent, you put it away directly into your profit account, and you can still run your business with five percent less money, right? Nice. So talk so, to me about the pri the profit account, because I know a lot of people get confused by that as well, in that they're thinking, oh, OK, this is, you know, uh, <laughs> icing on the cake. And to me, it's not really it's there. there it has a very um, pertinent function. So talk to me about that profit account. What is it? What is it for? Where does it go? All that kind yeah, of fun that jazz. Let's quickly go through the other accounts that they recommend sure. first. You yep. have the, you have the, um, to the the real income account, 
Mm -hmm. That's your income minus uh, materials. If you're producing something and you have a high material cost or you have a lot of subcontractors that you're paying, then you have an extra account where you put the money directly for the material and subcontractors. Otherwise, you have the real income. From that, you take the profit. You take your owner's compensation because you should pay yourself a salary. You should pay yourself for the work you do in your business. You take uh, an account for taxes and one for operating uh, expenses. And the profit account, that has actually uh, two purposes. Number one, it's your reward for being a successful entrepreneur. And you are a successful entrepreneur as soon as you're making money. So as soon as there's money in the profit account. Um, and the other, so every quarter you take 50% of that profit account and you spend it. Okay. You put it in yeah. your, <laughs> you put it in your play jar of the personal, um, exp of your personal money mm -hmm. and you spend it. Or what I do actually, I take half from that half I'm taking, I take half of it for just having fun with it. Mm -hmm. And half of it for uh, my investment account for my financial freedom. So that's what I do. And the other half that stays in the profit account is for building your safety fund. That's uh, building a reserve for the business. And for those of you can, confused that there are three halves to that account. <laughs> uh, okay. So there's, there's a big half and then there's taking the play money uh, and splitting it in half. <laughs> so it's actually a quarter, quarter, half. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> no big half and small halves there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Okay. So then we've got these accounts. Uh, we've got the play money, which in our case is usually uh, personal development courses and that include traveling, but then those become expenses again, which is also fun. Uh, but it's just a nice way to be able to separate them so that the, the travel account doesn't get out of hand <laughs> yeah well there's i do have the education account as well for for the education and i usually include the the trip to a seminar i include in the education cost but nice. that everyone can do that how, how they like <laughs> nice very cool okay so keep keep us going then then what so we've got our accounts we've got them separated We've got the accounts, we've got them separated. Um, and now we have the, oh, we didn't talk about the, the personal accounts. Okay. Uh, we have six personal accounts. Number one is the financial freedom account because you want to pay yourself first. Otherwise, yeah. it, it nothing's left at the end of the month. We have the long-term saving for spending account, meaning we're saving for bigger things that we can't uh, spend in, in one, uh, with one, pay in one month. Mm -hmm. like a new car, um, refurbishing your house or great family vacation, whatever, things like that. Then we have the education account for learning how to make more money in the future. We have the necessities account. Obviously, you have to pay your for food and shelter and energy and uh, all that stuff. Uh, we have the play account, which you have to spend every single month on pampering yourself, right? On making you feel better, making you feel rich. Because if you don't do that, if you only save and pay for necessities, you probably won't do that system very long. Mm. So you've got to pamper yourself and make yourself feel good, make yourself feel rich. Uh, so go for quality and not quantity in that uh, in that sense. And uh, the last one is the give account, 5% of your money um, to, to give away. First of all, uh, three reasons why you want to give. Number one, it's the right thing to do. <laughs> if you make money and help other people who, who can't um, or not in that situation as you are, then um, I think the universe is fair. If you give something, you'll get something back from wherever it comes from. Mm -hmm. And number three is working on your subconscious, right? We all learned that money is the root of all evil, that rich people are greedy and, and crooked and, and criminal and whatever. So really, really bad. And you don't want to be a bad person, right? So your subconscious will always protect you from becoming rich as long as you think that rich people are bad. Mm -hmm. Now, if you give, you're working on your subconscious. See, if I have money, I do something good with it. Give me more of it. Nice. Well, and I do think that, it, that it, there's kind of a psychological build there in that 
I, I think oftentimes people don't realize that once you get to a certain level of wealth, that there's almost a spiritual aspect that kicks in that you just want to to spend it on other people. You want to build the universities. You want to um, build the nonprofits and things like that. And I think that being able to focus that 5% on, on other aspects or 10%, whatever you decide is your thing, you start to research these groups. You start to understand more about philanthropy and what, it, what is actually you know, going to the community, to the people, what is actually getting you the, the, the end result that you wanted to get through your, um, through your charity, through your donations, whatever it might be. And, and I think that's an important aspect of our personalities that, that when we develop that and we understand it, then when we do have a lot more money and we are at the point where we're going, hey, do I wanna build a wing on a university or how do I wanna do this? That we have the capacity to understand how that is actually going to impact not only our finances, the, the trust accounts that we've set up, the nonprofits that we've set up, how does it all interplay with each other and how do we maximize that thought process? So we start small, you know, as Harv says, you start with a single ice cream cone, nobody gets triple cone to start with, <laughs> you get your single cone and you work with that. And once you've got a master, then you get to move up to the double cone and then the triple cone. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And if you say, I, I don't have enough money to manage, you do. Otherwise, you wouldn't be listening to this. You've, somehow you've got a device <laughs> to be able to listen to this. So you do have money to manage. And <clears throat> lots of people tell me, yeah, I will uh, start when I have more money. Right. That's like saying I will go to the gym once I've lost weight. Exactly. You sit in front of your fireplace and say, fire, give me warmth and then I'll give you wood. That's not how it works. <laughs> First, you start managing your money. And even if it's $10 you have, you start dividing your $10 and put a couple of cents in each of those accounts. Yeah. To just build the habit, tell the universe that I will I can manage, um, I can master that amount that I have. Mm -hmm. And then you can get more. Nice. So, yeah, however much money or little money you have, start taking care of it and always pay yourself first. Keep a little bit for yourself. Love it. With that, you can start working afterwards. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, yeah, how do we start working with it? Um, first, with education, <laughs> you got to learn a bit about um, what you're doing because people say, oh my God, investing is so risky. And Warren Buffett says it's only risky when you, if you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> Life is only risky when you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> Absolutely, right? <laughs> so there is four asset classes you can invest in, uh, which is paper, uh, which is stocks and bonds and this, this kind of stuff. There's real estate, uh, there's commodities, and there's business. These are basically the four things you can invest in. So pick one. <laughs> Or, or get a basic knowledge about all of them. So you, then you can pick one which you actually like. Mm -hmm. And then you learn more about that. And then you put your money in there. Uh, depends a little bit, of course, on how much money you have. Yes. <laughs> you won't be able to buy an oil well with your first dollar. Oh, uh, why not? <laughs> At least not the thing, but you can buy a share of it. There you go. Right? You don't need a lot of money to, to buy shares of something. Even if uh, today with all those um, online brokers, you can buy fractional shares. Which like is even, awesome. Yes. Yeah. Super awesome. You say, I, I want to invest in Amazon. Okay, now they're not that expensive anymore. But just a few months ago, an Amazon share was a trading at 2000 something dollars. Yes, it was very sad that it went down. <laughs> yeah. Don't remind me now. <laughs> <laughs> now but, but it's true. Back in the day, you had to buy a sheet of stock. And, you know, if the sheet was 200 stocks, then you had to fork out 200 stocks worth to be able to access that account. I mean, I'm going way back, but still, it's so much yeah. easier now to be able to just go, hey, I have 25 bucks. What do I want to spend it on? And you can spend it on anything, even yeah, Berkshire now, Hathaway. <laughs> it's like, yay. Those 25 on Amazon or on Berkshire Hathaway, one share of them, what is it? I don't know, three and a thousand or something. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so you can say, I want just buy me a fraction of it. Mm -hmm. And just to, this, and the easiest strategy that everyone can follow with 10 bucks a month is uh, cost averaging. Mm -hmm. uh, just do that every single month. 
and don't panic when it goes down. And celebrate that when it goes down because now it's on sale. Yay! <laughs> exactly. Now, uh, let's do a, a quick example so uh, people under, understand that. If you yeah. do, you drink wine. Do I drink wine? Yes, I do. Good. Okay. So let's assume your favorite wine bottle is a hundred dollars normally. Okay. Right. And you decide that every month you're willing to spend a hundred dollars on wine. So this month you buy how many bottles for your hundred dollars? One. One, exactly. And you don't drink it uh, immediately, you keep it. Okay. You put it in. <laughs> okay. It's got to go <laughs> in the cellar. <laughs> yes, it's going in your wine cellar. Now, next month, you see, oh my God, my favorite wine is, uh, uh, is on sale. It's only 50 bucks. Mm -hmm. And you buy two bottles. And the next month, you see, oh my God, it's even cheaper. It's down to 25. So you buy four bottles. You don't drink them, you put them in your wine cellar. <laughs> Right, that's the important part. <laughs> and next month, it goes back up to 50 and you buy another two. Mm -hmm. And then you see, oh, actually, normally my wine is $100 and now it's only 50. Um, did I lose money or did I make money with my wine? Now you spend 400 in total. You have uh, four, eight, nine bottles times 50. That's 450. So you actually made 12% profit with your wine. Yahoo! Yay! Um, in four months, 12%. Uh, what, how much does the bank pay you? <laughs> Nowhere close to that, right? No. In doing the same thing with oil, I made 76% in six months in 2020. Wow. So, uh, yeah, take something that goes down a bit, but that does not disappear. Something that comes back up. Yeah, wine does disappear because I drink it, but we'll still use oil after the crisis we'll still use um copper or we'll still still eat wheat drink coffee uh, so i like commodities as you might notice <laughs> but you can also go into companies that say we'll probably still order from amazon right after after recession and we'll still eat food uh, drink something and clean our houses yeah there's lots of companies that will still be there after a recession Mm -hmm. So buy them while they're cheap. Just don't think about it. Buy every month for the same amount or buy more when it's cheaper. That's the like professional level, mm -hmm. the advanced level. Buy more every time it dropped and keep doing that. And you'll have a nice profit once this all this chaos is over because it will be over sometime. It's always been like that. It always is and it always does. And, and that is a, a great assumption if your income remains the same. If your income goes down, you personally just keep the same percentage that you did before so it might might, might not be a hundred dollars every month but it's the percentage of whatever it is so even if you're going down you're still in the habit of putting that money away and it, i think it becomes especially important during those times to continue to do that even if it drops down to like five dollars you're still doing something with it and you're still in the mindset of i'm in control of my finances which is far more important especially in a downturn uh, because you got to know that you are in charge of your own economy. Absolutely. Coming back to, to Amazon in 2001, after the dot-com bubble, Amazon dropped to five or six dollars. Um, bye! <laughs> bye, 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 bye as much as you can. It went up to 2000, over 2000, right? Okay, right. that took 20 years, but still, um, come on, from five dollars to, to 2000, that's a nice profit, even if it's 20 years. <laughs> Um, or in 2008, you could buy a Citibank for three dollars. Wow! Most people didn't because they panicked, but it was definitely a very good price, <laughs> right? Well, and that brings up a whole new issue, is because I think the mindset it, you can have, especially in the states, you could have ten banks and go through a, a massive recession, and all of a sudden you have seven banks, and you hope you <laughs> put it, invested in the right seven. Or if you invest in all 10, then one of them goes up and, you know, you're, you're still ahead, even though three of them have been lost. And yeah. I think it's, it's, it comes back to that whole mindset of you've really got to start to understand how this all works and, you know, not putting all your money in one basket. Well, if you're putting them all in banks, you're kind of putting them all in one basket, but <laughs> thanks sir tend to be yeah, a little more out I wouldn't to pick growing. banks this time. Um, but anyway, if you don't want to pick one, you can take an ETF and yep. take the financial sector or take the tech. I would take the tech sector because that's going to be dropping a lot <laughs> further than they already have. So that's going to be cheap. 
but we still use technology after this, right? Exactly. So that might be an interesting thing or gold mining uh, ETF, whatever. There is, you take a whole sector and then you don't depend on one company surviving. Which brings us back to, there's a lot of education to happen here, people. We have hit the tip of, of the iceberg, uh, you know, with very light feathering of the snow on top of the iceberg. So let's start with, can you give us an example of one of your Cinderella stories of one of your clients now, somebody that's kind of was in the, <laughs> the chaos of, of money and what's going on and kind of where they're at now and working with you? Uh, yeah, well, one of my uh, clients, she was, um, she, yeah, didn't think about money, right? Um, money was actually, yeah, it's there and you have to, you have to deal with it sometimes, but uh, not for me, right? Not my topic. And yeah, we started with a money mindset. We started with a goal setting program. That's the first thing that she did with me. Uh, the next was a money mindset uh, program and already during that money mindset program, a client, an old client she already worked with, called her and gave her a project for the whole next year. Nice. Yeah. Um, she said, okay, my, the, the money issue is covered for, for a year now. <laughs> and then uh, she enrolled in, the, in my main program where we go through the three pillars of financial success. And by now she started investing. Uh, she has not only ETFs and stocks, she's already looking into options. Wow. Uh, and so one of her, a friend of hers who is trading and does a lot, is says, oh my God, how did you get into those things? Right. Uh, so she says her financial life is completely uh, turned around now. She does, is not afraid of not having enough money for retirement anymore. So, Aww. yeah, from in in a year, we went from money, what is it, <laughs> to being an, a happy investor that is not afraid of, uh, of the financial future anymore. Nice. I love that. Love, love, love. Uh, and, it, and it speaks so strongly to you that somebody can start <laughs> do, even doing research on options from being that person that hid the bills in the cupboard drawer and never looked at them. Uh, that's fantastic. I, I love that story. So what do you think some of the stumbling blocks <laughs> other than somebody stocking their bills into a, a cupboard that they never look at? Um, what are some of the things that they're going through in their life? And they think they're looking at you going, oh my God, Florian, I need you so badly right now. Yeah. Well, being the broke. Most, <laughs> being broke. Yeah. <laughs> well, the problem is, or one of the problems is we, somehow we learn that money is, has to be extremely complicated, right? finances must be this so I didn't like maths in school and numbers is the less language of money so I'll better leave it to someone else I let this the bank take care of it or the financial advisor or someone else well whose interest do those people have in mind in the first place their own right not yours so they will sell you the bank will sell you what they wear whatever product where they need money in mm -hmm. and the financial advisor will sell you whatever product pays the highest commission I know that because I did that, <laughs> right? And most other financial advisors are, are the same. So you have to take it in your own hand. And what I do is I make it as simple as possible. I mean, under, what do you need to know and what you don't need to know are two different, uh, they're big difference, right? You don't know how to build a car. Most of you probably don't know how to build a car, but you know how to drive one. Mm-hmm. And the same is true for, for the financial markets. You don't need to know how to build a hedge fund. Thank God. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You just need to know, okay, these are the products I'm, I want to learn about. And these one are the products I want to invest in. How do I get them? How do I open my brokerage account? How do I research what I want to invest in? And how do I place the trade, the, place the investment? Uh, so it's a lot easier than you think. Nice. And yeah, that's what I do with my people. I start from zero. And go slowly build to the place where you can say, okay, and now I know these the two websites that I need to do my research to find what I want to invest in. Uh, now I've got my brokerage account opened and can know how to place the trade. Love and I know how to manage my money. So suddenly I have more. Okay, they're excited. They're excited. So yeah. I know they're going to want more from you. How did they start their journey with you? 
how to start the journey, um, go to moneyheroacademy.com and find me there. And yeah, then start with anything. Where uh, you're at. <laughs> Always you're start at. with where you're at. Start with where you're at. Um, there's, I have two uh, free or low cost challenges. One is about an investment strategy that actually makes you money during that week. I have a free um, attracting money challenge. That's where we seven days we do um, work on the money mindset. Oh, and I have a free Facebook group where you can already get lots of tools, tips, techniques on how to be better with money um, and just start somewhere. And that's a good place. Love it. We will have all of Florian's links in the show notes, peeps, as you know. And you can always go to awarenessstrategies.com slash blog and type Florian or Fritz or money and <laughs> them. Uh, opening accounts, all that kind of fun jazz, and you will find him, I promise. Awesome. So Florian, I get to ask you at this point. What's that? I'm not I'm trying to not make it too hard to find me. Exactly. We'll we'll make it easy for you. So at what point in life did you know that you were especially kind of crazy enough to think that you could become an entrepreneur? I don't know. I've never been employed in my life. So, uh, <laughs> you know, um, right when, from I the finished, get -go. when I finished uh, university and uh, that, that was uh, right after the dot, dot com bubble had burst. So there were not a lot of jobs for somebody who had a degree in business administration and not in, not specializing in controlling. Um, so not a lot of jobs. So the first thing I did was around the world trip, which was a good idea. Fun. But when I came back after six months, it hadn't changed that much. So applying for jobs, they, first of all, there were not a lot of interesting ones. And mm -hmm. yeah, so that's how I actually got into the um, uh, becoming a financial advisor, because that was a company where, first of all, a friend from university was working there. Mm -hmm. And she asked, why are you not coming here? We need more uh, people. And so, OK, sounds interesting. I'm interested in finances. Uh, we can yeah. build something there, so great idea. And yeah, I've been self-employed ever ever since. Uh, I love it. I get the idea of switching from selling financial products to teaching. Yeah, mm -hmm. while I did uh, was on that education trip and learning, yeah. I also came across one of my main mentors in that area now, Blair Singer, who is friends to and advisor to Robert Kiyosaki. Yeah, and he got the idea in my head that I could be teaching. Nice. Yeah, Blair's awesome. I love Blair. Awesome. <laughs> Florian, you've been absolutely fantastic. Any last words for our peeps? Last words, uh, yeah. Um, take care of your money. Don't let anybody else do it or don't let your money do it, it by itself. It, that just doesn't work. So put it- Don't listen to Trudeau. Plan. Budgets do not balance themselves. <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> take care of your money yourself. It's easier than you think. And it's very rewarding because managing your money is like the most lucrative side business you can have. Love it. Thank you so much for your time, Florian. I appreciate it. And I know how valuable it is. Thank you so much for inviting me, Michelle. It was a pleasure. Awesome. Peeps, this is Michelle Nedelec. Thank you for being here with us today. Be sure to subscribe to the show and share it with your friends. We'd love helping entrepreneurs grow. Are you running a business over seven figures but still struggling with technology headaches? Pay attention. You do not want to miss this offer. This podcast episode is brought to you by Awareness Strategies, who is offering a custom-built digital adoption roadmap for anyone running a business over seven figures who's wanting to grow their business in the next five years. And it's not just a roadmap. They offer full implementation as well. If that scares the out of you, check out awarenessstrategies.com forward slash roadmap for more details today. The link's in the show's notes. Don't regret not doing this. Do it now. That's awarenessstrategies.com slash roadmap.